we'll probably get started and let any stragglers join us as, as they come along. Um, so today, thank you so much for joining us. And um, we do appreciate that everyone's diaries are getting a bit busier as we kind of get back into some kind of normality. Um, I know for FM, people in the FM and workspace arena and um, people returning yeah. to the office and so on is fraught with its own issues. So yeah. thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, we're talking today about how to create inclusive workspaces. So obviously an inclusive yeah. workplace should make all employees feel valued, welcome, um, and integrated and included in the workforce. Um, and in an inclusive culture, of course, everybody should feel as though they belong and that they can bring their full self to work. Um, but today we're going to be talking specifically about how the built environment, um, so the physical space, can actually support or hinder those inclusivity goals. Um, as always, we welcome questions. Um, it's really important to us that these sessions are interactive, so please do share any questions that you'd like answered. Um, and we hope to add some value for you today. Um, similarly, if you've got any really good examples of best practice of anything you know that we're, that we're talking about, please do pop it in the chat and we can share it with the rest of the group because the whole point of this is to get as much value creation for, for all of our attendees as possible. Um, so Gemma and I are pleased to welcome Jean and Simone today. So Jean Hewitt, um, thanks for joining us, Jean. Um, Jean is an Access and Inclusion Specialist for Bureau Happold. She's also an honorary lecturer um, is it at UCL, Jean, that you teach? Yes, it is. I thought it was, yeah. I <laughs> just wanted to check before. Sorry, I had to switch <laughs> mic on. Yeah, um, so she teaches a module on inclusive places, which is part of the MSc in Health, Wellbeing and Sustainable Buildings. Um, Simone Fenton Jarvis uh, chairs the IWFM Workspace SIG. Um, that's the special interest group that looks at a workplace um, within the institution and is currently the Workplace Consultancy Director for RICO. So we've got two panelists that have a lot of experience in creating inclusive workspaces. Um, so let's start off with a couple of broader questions to set the scene and then we'll hone in on a few specifics um, a little later. Um, so firstly, um, Jean, why is access and inclusion in the workplace important? Well, if it's not inclusive, I don't know what's going to happen to the workforce, really. No one has a uniform workforce with all the same needs. Um, it's a bit like flowers in a garden. We're all slightly different. We all have unique needs. And if we don't embrace this, what you end up with is um, a lot of people leaving early. So you're not retaining staff. You're not getting the best staff. Um, there are so many reasons, really. Um, and I'm going to steer away from the legal reasons why you'd want to do it, because I don't think that's that big a carrot. But, but I do think there's a lot of moral and social and good for business messages there. It makes a huge, huge difference. So we've got a really diverse um, uh, workforce in Bureau Happold. And I see that as a huge strength when we're designing or input into the design of buildings because you get those different perspectives. If you haven't got that, the whole design system of, of buildings is flawed and as will be the management side of things. Mm, absolutely. And Simone, from your point of view, why is access and inclusion in the workplace important? Yeah, I think simple again, you know, come say what Jean just said, it's the carrot bit and it's it's the right thing to do. I think for me, it's about bringing the, the human to work and actually to bring our best selves, we need to feel comfortable. Um, if we're going to be looking over our shoulder and, you know, tri tripping up on eggshells, then we, we're going to be on edge and, you know, you can bring all the neuroscience into that um, around cortisol and all that. But I think ultimately it's, it's the right thing to do. You know, we, we're all diverse and different people and I think everybody has a right to bring what they bring to the table. Absolutely. Um, how can the actual physical space support the DNI goals of an organisation, Jean? So a good working environment is going to be one that supports us physically and mentally and emotionally and everything. Um, so that's everything from being accessible to everyone. So typically, historically, we would think about wheelchair access, for example. But also it's so much more than that. 95% of disabled people, for example, just in that one strand of equality um, are not wheelchair users. So they have many other needs, including, including neurocognitive profile, um, such as neurodivergence, um, uh, people with different sensory needs. And of course, huge matter of mental health and well-being. So we're not all the same. We all thrive in different types of environments. So we, you know, a busy open plan office, for example, doesn't meet everybody's needs and it doesn't allow you to be as productive as you might be in to thrive and to maintain your mental well-being if that's not the right environment for you. Some people love it. Um, so we have to have a mix and we have to give, we have to have the agility, I think, 
to, and that's what true inclusion is. It isn't just about the design, it's also about the management, how we use the space and everything. I think it's really important. Mm, absolutely. Um, what are the biggest mistakes that you see that companies make when they say, okay, well, we want to create an inclusive workspace? You know, do people kind of go off on one tangent and, you know, only think about, about one thing? Or do you, do you see any kind of real common mistakes that people make when they're trying to do the right thing? Um, I think it's getting a lot better than it was 20, than 20 years ago when I first started doing this. But people are still making assumptions um, based on stereotypes or just appearance. They're making assumptions about who you are, what your class is, what your 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 impairment or not non-impairment is, what your faith is, uh, your gender and everything else. And, mm. and we really need to try and help people not to do that. Mm. So when you have good policies in place for a workplace, that's sending out a key message to everyone. So you're sending out what's inclusive about it, what's accessible about it. And people are listening to that and are thinking, oh, that's how we should be behaving with our teams and so forth so it has a knock-on yeah. effect and the mm. clients are looking at this as well so I think most of it doesn't cost much money it just requires a bit of thought and and of course awareness so yeah. anyone including FMs who's raising awareness on this matter is just critical to it I mean they're the first to get complaints to be honest mm. um, and they're the first probably wow. to realize that the building doesn't meet people's requirements so they're really key probably more so than the actual designers sometimes mm. And what are your thoughts, Simone? I know you raised your hand. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, the, the bit that is the mistake really is that we think of the things that we see first. So it, it ends up being a little bit like we, we miss the things that are unseen. And that might be personality type, for instance. It might just be um, a, a mental health problem. And I think we're really good as FM to really look at the, the things that are seen and are talked about more. But then I think sometimes as well, it also turns into tokenism and it's been done for the wrong reasons. So I think some of the things, um, you know, I could talk about that for a while. So, yeah. Well, tell us a little bit more then. So, so what is, what, how would somebody know if, the, if they're kind of falling into tokenism? What, what would be some, some kind of key, key areas that yeah. they should be aware? I think it's, it goes back to the carrot and stick. Why are you doing it? And if it's because you want to create a, a welcoming workplace for everybody for the right reasons then brilliant you know that's not tokenism I think if it's say we want to tick a box um because we've not got x y and z in our demographics and we need to attract them to the workplace um and we need to feel like we need to do something to do that and it's a bit of a tick box rather than the actual culture change mm. I think that's where we we're treading on uh thin ice really yeah, um, the importance of FM in this journey, I know obviously, you know, within the design aspect, um, you know, that, that um, people are looking at, at these elements, but FM really has a part to play in this, doesn't it? I guess that's what you're doing within your, your special interest group, SIG, isn't it, within the workspace, Simone? So yeah. do you want to just talk a little bit about the importance of facilities management in, the, in this journey to creating the, these workspaces that work for all? Yeah, I think, you know, we, you, you always go back to FM being that hub of the office, you know, FM are the ones that know everybody. Um, you know, I, I actually followed an FM around the workplace last week. It was lovely to get out of the house. And I followed the work, the FM around the workplace and um, just had a tour of the place. And every single person that they walked past, it was, hi, how are you doing? How's this? How's that? And I think, it, again, it reminded me of the, the power of FM. And I think that's where the inclusion bit can come because I think FM will generally know what ch people's challenges are. And again, the unseen, not just the seen challenges and not just the legal challenges. Um, and I think that's the that bringing the, the community and, you know, creating that workplace ultimately that is is right for everybody. Mm. I know, Jean, that you're quite unique, aren't you, in terms of you're, you're from an FM background, but there aren't many people working in this space that necessarily are from, from facilities management. What do you think your FM background brings to, to um, creating inclusive spaces? Yeah, you're right. I'm, 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 as far as I know, I'm the only one that's come from an FM background that's moved into access inclusion, like inclusive design. Um, I do attract a lot of clients who are the FMs within a portfolio or a building and so forth, to know that I'll, I'll understand all the you know, complexity of FM, but how accessibility and inclusion applies to that. So um, the smallest thing from your sit stand desk policy and what percentage that is, which is often too small or, you know, people having personal evacuation plans. It's, you know, the FM 
is tied into so many aspects. So many years ago, 20 years ago or so, um, I was involved in some research projects and working with the Disability Rights Commission. And they basically said, the FM holds the DDA baby. Many people on this call remember the term DDA and disability discrimination. But what they were saying is, you know, the designers need to get it right, but the ultimate responsibility at the end is always handed over to NFM. And if they don't get it right, we haven't got an inclusive space at all. So it's such a, such a critical role. So it's everything from adjusted working hours, which might mean you opening your building a bit earlier so someone can get a seat on the train, right through to how they get out in a fire emergency. So they've got quite a mix there to, that they can influence, particularly on the disability side, I think, but also, you know, maybe faith rooms and, and, and some other areas that we're now coming across, which we'll touch on, I know. Um, I'm just interested at this point um, to just take a quick poll. Um, I'm just going to ask um, our audience today, um, hopefully you can all see this on your screen, um, is your workplace inclusive and do you feel as though you belong? Um, the answers are yes, no and don't know. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. People are busy voting. Okay, so that's a pretty good result. It's actually higher than I, oh, it's changing. <laughs> Hang on, still people voting. Sorry, I was a bit too quick for everybody. <laughs> I just wanted to come it's off. It's like Eurovision. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Nil> Nilpois. <laughs> um, I just wanted to come off something that uh, Jean has said. Um, it's really important for those that lead FM and the workspaces to really understand the people that are coming in are actually going to be using them. It isn't just about the employees and the visitors, um, just across the board, it's exactly how does everybody access things. Um, and I think there has been a big shift and change in how people are now designing those types of offices um, to include those types of accesses uh, for people to ensure that they do feel inclusive. Yeah, and that was a quite a surprising poll. So well done all everyone that works in those spaces. So 74% of people said that they did feel that their workspace was inclusive and that they did belong. So that's pretty good. But there is still almost a quarter that either don't know, um, but but more importantly, are a clear no, um, you know, and that's, you know, potentially one in four, that, that's still, still too many. Um, how important is it to communicate the inclusivity message throughout an organisation? So say you've created some, some space and you, you, you've got reasons for why things are a certain way and why the noise level is this and why the lighting is that. Um, do you really need to communicate that to all users of the space or does it, does it not really matter to the vast majority of space users? Um, do you have a, a view on that, Simone? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's uh, would you communicate it if it was a, a, a visible disability or something? Um, would you communicate that? You know, you wouldn't, if it was DDA, for example, you wouldn't go, that ramp's there just in case we have a wheelchair user. You wouldn't communicate that. <laughs> so why would you communicate yeah. anything else? For me, it's it's got to be really ingrained in the culture and it's just mm -hmm. an inclusive environment. And I think if we're having to say it and having to wave certain things in people's faces, then we're probably trying to push something without actually bringing the people along the journey with us. Mm. Mm. And do you have a view on that, Jane? Yeah, it's slightly different, I think. That's uh, good. There, there, <laughs> are, there are many, many, no, not completely different, but I mean, I, I completely get what you're getting from, coming from, Simone, but I think there are a lot of things that, are, that can be um, quite hidden in the environment. And if we're not careful, people don't know they're there. So. An assistive listening system is an example, like inductionally, or, you know, people need to know that they are, I'm a hearing aid wearer, and, and you need to know it's there to take advantage of that. Um, and so they have to put the symbol up. And, and if they don't do that appropriately, it's quite good to have comms plans reminding people when you're booking spaces, please, you know, make sure you've booked a room with an assistive listening device. Have you asked your guests what their needs are? Even if they're fellow employees, you might not be aware. And that sort of thing. So there, I think there's both both sides to this. That it yeah. shouldn't be necessary, but but yeah. for some things it still is. And the the peeps plan, the personal emergency evacuation, is a case in point because yeah. um, people say, oh, will you come and do peeps plan, Jean, for our disabled people? I said, no, but I'd come and do it for anybody that needs it. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of those people don't think of themselves as disabled at all. They could be heavily pregnant or have a sports injury, or something else going on. Yeah, yeah. But it's really important that all that messaging is always inclusive and doesn't always say this is only about disability, this is only about race or faith. Because really, you could have multiple strands of equality. 
Um, so several might apply to you. So push it out to everyone's better, I think. Yeah, that's great. And I, because I absolutely agree as well. I think it, it's that, um, I think when it comes to, yes, people need to know, because I think, it, you know, things like signs, like the nudge theory, it definitely comes into it. People need to be reminded because it's easy to forget about why some things are there especially for FM when we just used to be ninjas behind the scenes, just kind of doing everything without shouting about it. So I, I totally agree. And I think there's, there's definitely, yeah, definitely different many arguments that you could come at it with. Sure. Before we go on, and um, we've had a question and um, somebody just wants to, wants to explain what we mean by FM. Um, I think I've made an assumption that everybody on the call understands what facilities management is. So FM is short for facilities management and facilities management are the, as Simone just said, the behind the scenes ninjas <laughs> that basically run buildings. So they basically keep the lights on, make sure everybody's safe, um, you know, make sure that the space is safe and that it's fit for purpose and fit for use. I think it's probably the, the easiest way to describe it unless anyone else wants to jump in with it description but sorry for making assumptions that um that everybody knew what that meant so fm is facilities management there just for anybody that is from europe we would call that workplace experience leaders so it's anything to do with that workplace so just as what you said from a, from anybody in uk we know what fm is but anybody that may be in out and in europe it is kind of about that human experience that workplace that we go into in those spaces so yeah fantastic thank you um, i know Gemma, that before we get into specifics looking at you know actual um areas that we need to look at to ensure that, that we are um, looking at inclusivity i know that you had a couple of questions you'd like to pose Gemma. so pass over to you Okay, sorry, that was my son asking me a question, which I'm clearly trying to not answer. <laughs> so it's always the way, isn't it? Um, so I just wanted to ask the panel, um, given that, you know, I work for a, a, an international company and I'm sure you've had international clients as well. Um, where there are progressive companies in who have offices in countries where maybe homosexuality is uh, prohibitive or even illegal, how can we deal with the designing of an inclusive and diverse uh, workspace in those particular countries? Should I go first? Um, I think it, go, it kind of goes back to if, if we're in a country that um, is that that's the culture, then would DNI be at the top of the agenda for an organisation? Um, and I think it's bearing in mind that just because it's not the top of the agenda doesn't mean that there's not people within that organisation that need to be included um, and need to belong into that organisation. Um, I think it's it's difficult when we're talking about changing cultures that are, you know, really kind of hardwired. Um, into many many countries um, and you know many different religions as well and you could it's a, it's a super difficult kind of topic that we have to take tentative steps to because at the same time as shouting for inclusivity we also don't want to offend anybody who sits on the other side of the argument so I think we have to bear in mind that we just need to pay respect to everybody really who's in that environment um, and I think it's a, let's just be respectful of each other and then try and create a workplace that reflects that respect, I guess. Thank you. Jane? And that's a difficult answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you, Jane? It's a difficult one because obviously we can't impose our, our way of living and our standards on other parts of the world, but I think we can possibly influence it. I mean, obviously I was sitting on the design um, consultancy side of things rather than being inside a building running it. We've got offices all over the world and I know um, for example um, the Gay Pride group we changed our logo with the rainbow symbol for I think a, a week or so and that that was across the world so other cultures would, would see that and it gives them an opportunity then to um, explore that within their teams just to raise awareness that we are you know, we have, we have different views on this, more, more liberated views, um, more equality minded views elsewhere. So it's not dictating it, it's quite subtle, but I think clients see that and think, oh, you know, why has it changed? And so for, it gives you the opportunity to talk about it and encourage, gradually encourage others to change. It, it can take a long time sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah, I think as well, um, it goes back to the whole nature nurture argument. I know, Jean, you just said it's the, the ways of living and other people's choices and things. And it's 
it is a it is a nurture thing as a as a female lesbian um i can say that it is it's not a it's 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 a it is a nature thing it's not a nurture thing and i think it's a so it's not necessarily a way of living or a choice and i think it's having that um almost that understanding and come, we need to have difficult conversations otherwise things are not going to change i think is the point great um, I will just want to point out, obviously, yesterday we had the trans uh, phobia awareness day of people that, you know, are being sub subjected, unfortunately, due to, um, you know, their homosexuality. And from, from my perspective in JLL, you know, we had one of our employees actually um, post, it was a beautiful video about her own journey with her transgender son and how JLL had actually really supported that. So for me, even though she's actually based out in Poland and we know everything that's going on there with the rolling back of obviously um, LGBT rights that, you know, as a company, we have come out and stood by our employees. So for me, it's, it's a, as you said, it's a very difficult way to try and change. But if you can influence in any way and somebody then is able to have a voice, that means that somebody else somewhere else can see that and potentially then obviously step into those, those shoes and know that they can also be empowered. My other question is just to do with accessibility, because I know, again, across different countries, we, there are specific codes that can actually be uh, placed in for accessibility to a building. So I want to ask you, so like a twofold question, I suppose. Um, which is the one you would typically apply in this given situation? Number one. Uh, where it's very restrictive and acts as an overarching global framework for accessibility, so it's just one overall uh, framework, or do you think that it needs to be specific to those particular regions and or countries? So one for, yeah, so one, one for I start with I that one. I'm sorry. I'll go on. Go on. <laughs> Does it, I, say, I think it needs to be specific, but with a nod to the overarching global standard. So I think we, again, it's it's a nod because it's a slow change that's going to need to occur. Um, and I, I think we have to, you know, we can't have countries that, are, you know, because what happens if someone from the UK travels to another country and then the, the environment's not inclusive to them. So I think it's, a, it's up to a culture of the company. I think the company's actually got a really powerful position here to really drive belonging, inclusive diversity, to say, you know, yes, this isn't what we do in this country, However, it does affect people within this country. And this is what happens in other countries. And I think, you know, it's that mindset thing. I think that'll help. Yeah. Jean, I'm just going to add that? some um, good news on that front in that um, until very recently, our standards are quite different to it to elsewhere in the world. Um, and there's been a step forward. So in the last four weeks I've received a copy of a new SEN standard which is a European standard on accessibility to the first and it's very thorough so it's it's fairly closely aligned to our British standards here for accessibility which is really good news um, and of course there'll be pockets in there that's slightly better than ours and pockets that are slightly uh, less good and uh, we are moving um, up force ahead in, in one or two areas that others aren't um, but we do have people, so I sit on a British Standards Committee um, and there are others on that committee who sit on the ISO, the International Standards and also the European. And there's also um, about to be, or certainly this year, an ISO, a new ISO, an updated ISO on accessibility as well. So of course you've got in the States, you've got ADA so and, and right lots now. of other things um, that are going on in, in different standards. But a lot of the base dimensions and everything are, are pretty equal in terms of physical it's good to know thank you that was really my two questions because you covered off a little bit about um the dibs and the belonging part so thank you no worries so um i'd like to talk now a, in a bit more detail really about um you know specifics around space um so let's start with neurodiversity so Jean I'm, I'm going to come to you on this because I know this is something that you've got a lot of experience on so can you just explain what neurodiversity is and how the spaces we create and manage can support the neurodivergent okay so neurodiversity is everyone um in in some fields if you if you google it it, it will be particularly led by um autism but back, basically a neurodiverse brain is everybody's brain type. So it's neurotypical, neurodivergent, and neurodegenerative, which is obviously things that are progressive like, and you acquire with age quite often like dementia. 
so there's three bands there and then the neurodivergent band is is basically anyone that's uh, not neurotypical so what that experience is like in terms of the built environment is that you might get um you might be hypersensitive or hyposensitive so you'll experience the environment too much everything's overload or not enough and then you you need to self-stimulate yourself in other ways so add color add activities and stimming and, and stuff like that um, most of the standard that I'm working on, which I'll come on to later, is around trying to make those um, severe uh, sensitivity to lighting, acoustics, patterns and so forth better um, uh, and not so dramatically um, overloading people um, by the way they're designed, really. So you say you could come on to it later, but what, what are the kind of key things that we need to look at? Is it just sound and lighting and signage, that kind of thing? Or is there anything else that, that we need to be looking at? Is it the materials that are being used in the building as well? Or Well, so I'm working on a PAS for um, the BSI at the moment. So that's a publicly available standard, which is basically a standard in development. It comes out for a couple of years and if people like it, they adopt it, it gets incorporated. Um, and at first I thought it would be mostly, so I'm not a deep, deep expert on this, well, I'm, it's growing, um, as you can imagine. So I'm technical author, so I've got a, a steering group of experts um, feeding stuff into me, and it's based on some research by the BSI on talking to people with neuro neurodivergent um, strands, um, which could be ADHD, autism, dyspraxia, dyslexia, uh, uh, and many more, and, and including some that I hadn't heard of before I started. So um, you can be a hypersensitive person, HPS, or sensory, sensory sensitive person. So there's all these different initials. And because there's so many labels to it, it's dil diluting how we look at this. And I actually think when you add them all up, it's probably around 30% of the population that, mm. that experience some of this, including people who are migraine sufferers or balance conditions, all triggered by their environment. So what we're looking at in the PAS is we have a section on lighting with acoustics and we're, we're, we're signposting to the standards that are already out there, try and make sure people are at least following those, um, but, but given quite a lot of description about the impact it has on people. And there are other things as well that I hadn't thought so much in so much detail, one being um, sense of smell and olfaction, and that, you know, like even putting like off-gassing of carpets and the products and finishes that we put in can impact on someone much more. We've all been on the train where somebody clearly is very unhappy that someone else is woofing you know perfume around and that sort of thing I mean it's that sort of thing but being hyper hypersensitive to it so it's quite broad it looks at building facades and internally so it's a, it's um it's a much more detailed standard actually than I anticipated it would be at the outset so yeah and once that's published that'll be in the public domain do you have an, an idea of when that's going to be published and when it's going to be live it's been out to the steering group once already, has another round of that shortly, and then it goes off to a review panel, which will you know, a voluntary review panel once we look at it beforehand. Um, I think ultimately it will be available um, probably around October, November time. Fantastic. Um, so definitely, the, definitely this year. It's running a bit behind. COVID's delayed things a bit, um, <laughs> as it has everything. Yeah, but, as yeah. everything. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, one of the questions that we've had, um, I don't know if it's specifically around um, what we're talking about, about neurodivergency, but um, someone's asked if there's any examples of excellent inclusive workspaces or workplaces. They find case studies always, always to be a useful reference. Um, are there any um, particular um, you know, flagships that, that people should be looking at or, or any particular really good practice that, that you anyone knows of? I think there's pockets of examples. So, for example, on the neurodiversity um, angle, I was involved with um, BBC and their new headquarters in Cardiff, and, and they've been quite successful in some of the interventions there, and certainly some of the interventions we made there fed, it, fed into my thinking around um, designing for neurodiversity in the first place. So okay. um, there are examples like that. But I think if you look at any building, it's the same with all, of, all strands of accessibility, you're never going to find a completely perfect building that does it all. There are all so really when we're looking at case studies we try and pick a couple of nuggets out and not saying we're not saying the paving outside is perfect or the front door is perfect we look at this great scheme they've got internally and sharing that at least and mm. there are civic trust awards that particularly focus on accessibility okay. so, so that's quite good but even those when we go out and judge those they, we have to be realistic they're not going to be perfect but they're probably going to be much better than your average. 
Yeah. So, man, do you have any examples of anyone that you know is doing this particularly well from your work as chair of um, the um, I have some from my RICO world, but I can't name, um, unfortunately, okay. without uh, checking beforehand. No, no, that's but, fine. Um, but I think there's, there's plenty out there. Yeah, there is plenty out there. I hope that answers your question, Ren. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, I did just before you go on. Sorry, Nikki. I do want to no say as well, just the same way with us uh, at JLL. Again, I, I can't name names, but we definitely are a company that is leading our clients to look at inclusive workplaces from a neurodiversity perspective, and not just by a disability, but that also does include, you know, our colleagues that may be transgender as well, and making sure that they feel included. Too, when you think about designing for you know the uh, shower or the changing rooms and things like that so there there are lots of companies that are coming up coming out soon with insights and white papers because they are working with some really big corporations out there to try and change that landscape so i do think they will be coming um so i say keep an eye out is what i would say on that Thanks, man. i think this is what everyone's saying definitely watch this space um, Simone, i know you had some thoughts around um designing for personality type um, anything that you'd like to add there? Yeah, I mean, I think from a personality type point of view, again, it's one of them unseen things. So I remember working in an open plan office a few years ago um, that was quite loud. Um, it was where it, the position that I was sat, for anyone that's got me on kind of LinkedIn, I did a bit of an ask about this a few weeks ago, actually. So the position I was sat in the workplace was not inclusive for an introvert. Um, which is what I am. Um, it was in the middle of the workplace and people walking past me all the time, people tapping me on the shoulders because I was trying to put my headphones in just to zone out for a little bit and recharge myself. And I think on that front, I think it's been aware of making sure that, so we, we talk about creating spaces of the four C's, so to communicate, to collaborate, to concentrate and to contemplate. And I think with them four things in mind, that that fits across and again it's not about an introvert you know i i don't i can still talk to people and come on webinars and talk to people um it's not that i'm some shy kind of hermit you know wondering i don't need to go near people but it's about re and it's about breaking down and barriers and the, the stereotypes as well of i meet people who go you were you're, you're an introvert i'm like yeah it doesn't mean i can't talk it just means that i'll be really tired later so i'll <laughs> and i think it's breaking down that it's shy people and not just necessarily introverted yeah and I think it's just just understanding isn't it I know when we spoke Jean it's just understanding that um the impact that you know we're spent obviously a lot of people working from home at the moment but before that COVID you know people are spending up to 10 hours a day in these environments and you know that is going to start to have an impact if people I mean I'm a migraine sufferer myself and we talked about Jean about you know flickering lights and you know things that are too hectic I, I get a bit overwhelmed with with sound and you know absolutely I haven't really thought about it before and, and you know mine isn't anything on any kind of you know um recognized spectrum or anything like that so i can only imagine how difficult it must be or for people that have got you know some kind of hearing loss it must be really difficult in a cacophony of an open plan office i think for such a long time everybody just went down the open plan route didn't they and but you know even some of these collaborative spaces can be quite busy and quite loud and i think giving people these options is just so important which is why i was so keen to have this have this con um, conversation and debate today yeah, I think as well on that collaboration spaces, you know, you often see, say, take a canteen and there'll always be, you know, desk and seating that's for six to eight people. And it's always, you know, let's put bench seating in there and bench seating, you know, people wearing skirts, not ideal to get in a bench seat, apparently, to wear skirts, but it's, it's a challenge. Um, and then you've also got, um, you know, people like myself who actually, I want to just take half an hour out at lunchtime and just maybe sit with one or two people that I want to have a close chat with. I don't want to sit on a bench of people, a bench of table of all the people who want to then force a conversation out of me. It just drains me even more. So I think it's taking into that consideration of the whole spaces and making sure that it's, there's a choice ultimately about, you know, if I want a conversation, I'll go and sit on a, a bigger table. If I want to just chill out for a little bit, I'll, I'll sit on a smaller one. I think it's making sure that we're, we're catering for them different things. Yeah, absolutely. And that people have a choice for sure. Um, we talked about contemplation, and I think that leads quite nicely onto faith spaces within the workspace. Um, do you have any words of wisdom or advice as to how to effectively provide multi-denominational space that works for everybody? Um, are there any standards on this? Are there any? Is there any guidance? Do you want to take this one, Simone, or Jean, do you want to? 
you want to give that to Yeah, yeah. So some things I'd say, my tips are, if you're going to have a faith room and you think it's not being used, do not turn it into a storage cupboard. <laughs> That's basically, we always, the amount of faith rooms that I've gone in and it's, oh, we just put them boxes there because it's a, an empty room, don't get used much. It's like, no, don't do that. So that would be one, one thing that I have noticed. I think measuring the, the usage of it, you know, you could go down that route, but again, it's about making sure, not necessarily just for faith, it might be someone that just needs five minutes. Um, you know, it could just be, it could be meditation. That's a faith, you know, from a Buddhism point of view. So it's not just about a certain religion or anything. And I think it's about, again, make sure you've got them spaces available to people because you never know who wants to use them. Nikki, you on mute. My dog was, sorry, I'm on mute because my dog was barking. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> um, Jean, are there any are there any particular um, guidance um, or, or any standards for, for anything around faith rooms? Is there anything you're aware of? Um, there's going to be. Oh, okay. So, tell me more. So there's, there's the existing standards. Um, there's no national standards for starters. Um, there are um, some standards that have been developed by London Legacy Development Corporation, which we were involved in, and they cover, cover faith. And of course, they, they are the body that established the Olympic Park. So they, they were looking at all the faith needs for that. So that makes sense that that's quite well established. Um, and not specifically for faith, but within the past, one of the things that's really, really important for people who experience sensory overload is a um, restorative space or a quiet room. And of course that can be used for certain aspects of faith as well. Um, so we're, we've got quite a big chapter in the past that's been um, contributed greatly by um, a student of mine at UCL. So I'm really grateful to her for that. Um, so, and that's based on quite, you know, very recent research about what, what, what is a good quiet space? What, what do people need to contemplate, focus, recharge, get away from things? Mm. And I think that will work equally as a faith room. The only difference would be that you obviously then need to consider whether you um, have um, widow facilities and things like that as well. Yeah. But some of those requirements are actually doing that LLPC yeah. guidance. Okay, thank you. Simone? Yeah, the bit I was going to add actually that Jean just added was, you know, making sure that you've got the wider facilities, it's not just about the room, but actually the washing facilities as well for people. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that, that's the one thing I was going to mention before, that's why I took it down quickly. <laughs> okay. um, someone's asked, how do you quantify how much space you need for each type of space in the workplace? Is there a standard? Is there a rule? How, how do you work that out? So how much do you allow for, for collaboration? How much do you allow for office space, Jean? Yeah. Um, we wouldn't normally decide that. So we would, we would be working with architects who will design it and then we will comment. So we will um, have to comment back to them to say how much space we need for toilets, for example. Yeah. Quite often they're undersized um, and the different types of toilets as well. Yeah. Um, and that specific areas need to exist they need to be at least this size but we wouldn't dictate yeah, fine, the relationships um, that would be more the well, well, um, anyway, but obviously fm's influences if they're involved and they, they have a great um so let's oh, you meet with yourself on you see us again the key Sorry, guys. Um, let's talk about gender-neutral bathrooms. Um, you think after a year and a half of being uh, <laughs> doing Zoom calls, I'd remember the mute, mute button, wouldn't you? I need that, that T-shirt that says you're still yeah. on mute, don't I? Sorry about that, everybody. Um, gender-neutral yeah. bathrooms. I I was... You've done it again. Oh. You're back on mute, back mate. On <laughs> there's someone telling you not to talk I don't know what's going on <laughs> I was going to actually add something yeah that is so weird. how is it going back on? I didn't even know I was going to add something to what Jean just said oh, yeah uh, yeah around um, the, the spaces now to allocate them I think you know it's a, a massive thing at the moment you know the whole whole talk about hybrid working you know people ripping out desks and saying let's put collaboration spaces in it's a little bit knee-jerk in my opinion, but I think when you start looking at that whole um, what spaces do we need and for what reason, I think that goes into the, well, how are your people working? How many people are in the office at what times? It's not a, there is standards from a legal point of view, but that doesn't mean it's right for every single workplace. Yeah. And I think it's about really getting to know what your people are doing, the way that they're working, the way that technology is used, for instance, 
um, you know, getting teams together um, in this dispersed kind of working environment as well. So it's not a straightforward answer. And I would just encourage you to collect lots of data um, around how your people are thinking, feeling, how they're actually using space, not just from a, you know, people that are utilizing like desk booking systems, for example, at the moment, it's, oh, well, we're going to be able to see then how much space we need. And I said, no, you're not. You're going to be able to see how much space your people think they need is what you now need to do is look at how your people are actually using the space, not their intentions. And I, th I think it's really been quite critical of the data that, you know, people are throwing at you. Um, and, and, you know, if you're getting stuck, get some, get some actual advice from somebody that is doing it day in, day out. Um, with yeah. Recommendation. Yeah, Jacqueline okay. very rightly put, um, it's data-led, human-centred, but data-led design depends yeah. on what the space is being used for and who is using the space, for sure. Exactly. I was going to say, just off the back of Simone, time and motion oh, study. Yes. So anybody who doesn't have the data or, or potentially sensors within their offices to actually feed that back yeah. and see where the pockets of people are working and moving in the office, then do take the time out and do, you know, just your normal time and motion study and see exactly who's using what, who's using the lifts, who's using the stairs. You know, um, how many people are wanting to be at a stand up desk or a sit down desk, etc. And then that gives you, as you said, more information of exactly what people are using the, that space for. It's not just about booking a desk and sitting at it. It's so much bigger yeah. and wider than that. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. And the mindset and shift as well. Yeah, Sorry. for sure. Uh, it's Russell, hard, isn't it, when you're on an actual webinar? <laughs> <laughs> um, the FCA have an amazing accessible office with neurodiverse facilities, apparently. That's the Financial Conduct Authority. I think they're over at Stratford now, aren't they? I think um, Ross has, has said that. So thanks for sharing that, Ross. Um, right, I will talk about gender-neutral bathrooms. That's what I was trying to talk about. You've gone on mute again. <laughs> Would you like me to talk about gender-neutral bathrooms? I'm literally not touching anything. This is the most, I've got a little glitch in the system. That is really bizarre. Right, I'm not going to touch anything. Um, look, look, no hands. <laughs> um, they're an emotive subject. Why are they needed? What is the best practice around installing them? What considerations should there be? Lots of things to talk about. So I'm going to leave it over to you and I'm not touching anything. Look. <laughs> Jean, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, of course, yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, interestingly, there's been a recent government consultation around the male and female uh, toilet provision and gender neutral oh, right. and what people want. And they've come out as of Sunday, um, it's been released that um, the planning perspective that people must provide male and female. As far as I can see, it stops short of saying you must also have gender neutral, but of course we, we definitely want that as well so that the male female facilities so, are, are um, better at accommodating yeah, the numbers quantity yeah, of numbers and the fact that finals take up their space but you do do gender neutral as well and accessible so we need we need a mix and it would be better for mix being a requirement rather than just um just you know male and female is the only one that's mandated that's that's it. And, and the odd accessible toilets that seem to go far enough i could be wrong because i haven't read detailed enough but what i saw on sunday was that there was a definite um planning led steer i believe on on male female uh, jeremy you might know more about this in your role sorry i was doing something because my son was asking me a question <laughs> So can I, I'll just pick up um, a question that uh, Tony came to us. So how do you navigate the differing views and demands around safe spaces for cis women? He's got safe and inverted commas. Safe spaces for cis women versus being inclusive of other people who identify as women when it comes to toilets and changing rooms and etc. Um, so Jean, would you like to pick up on that? Yeah, so that it, I think it's about a balance. So we would normally, most of the projects we're working on now are saying we want some of each um yeah so um there are all sorts of reasons and it's a very complex um consideration um but there are some some ladies of faith or women of faith who who can't go and happily use a male facility and so on so or a facility that's been used by a male so there, there are reasons why we do need that there are reasons sometimes around or what was shown in the research i think was a lot of people worried about 
security and safety in certain settings, not in an office mm -hmm. typically, but elsewhere. Yeah. So that drive has come out, and um, uh, but I think we'll healthily see a good mix. And actually, if you design all your bathrooms, there's the potential to be gender neutral. You can soon designate one or two to be male, female if you need to. Yeah. So people don't need to panic about this overnight either. You did mention that they do need more space because you should have the good practices to have the basin within the, the actual stool. Can you just talk a little yeah. bit about that? So if it's um, gender neutral, it needs to be self-contained with the basin. So um, lots of people are very uncomfortable. There are lots of medical reasons and other reasons why we'd want this, but we wouldn't want to go out into an open area to use basins alongside you know, male, female, and different people. So the gender neutral is much, much better. Mm -hmm. I would say also we've got around 4 million people in the UK who have a toilet phobia, like a shy bladder syndrome, which means they find it really difficult to go and use a cubicle when it's not full height uh, and people can hear well they perceive people mm. can hear so the gender neutral provision is also helping many many people um, with those conditions as well so I think mm. it's a big plus we don't want to lose it but we do need to recognize that there's an yeah. email and what well, particularly female only as well yeah I do just want to say I worked for a client that had gender neutral toilets um and you could walk through the door and there was a toilet directly in front of you, which had a sink, a basin, everything that you wanted. Or you could go into the through another door and you'd have all stalls. So and it was the first time that I even really noticed it. And, you know, for other women who may be using um, a, a menstrual cup, that's great. Yeah, they can they don't have to then go into the side cubicle because how they're going to get rid of anything and wash it. So it's exactly the same way of it. Uh, being accessible again for everybody uh, whether that's somebody who is cis or or, or uh, transitioning or it's somebody that's got disability or just a, a female that needs to use the toilet to do their monthly it, it needs to be open to everybody when they're thinking about those designs but you know that's going back a good six seven years ago and I thought it's fantastic every single floor of the 14 buildings that's how they were built so yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Ross, uh, someone has asked, Jamie, I think has asked, what's our, our view on the lack of changing places facilities in the workplace? Um, he, said, he says that he's a changing places designer and would like to see more, especially in Cornwall. One in 260 people need a CP. Yeah, so in case you don't know what a pl changing places toilet is, it's a, an enlarged accessible toilet that's intended for assisted use and it's got a hoist and a changing bed in it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of funding around at the moment for public buildings to have these um, and there's categories of public building that are listed and actually it's come into the building regulations now so new build if you're involved in new build at all you need to look at that list because you probably need to make some provision if it's a public building if it's um, a commercial workspace situation is quite different at the moment but i do find um, many clients are now starting to embrace that and, and having one or two, particularly in their bigger sites. So, um, and many people with the aspiration to many more. Um, and that's because they have visitors coming in as well, but also you can get deeper needs amongst the employees. And then you can't cater for them in the standard accessible toilet that we all have, because that is intended for independent use. So that it's a very different type of um, facility, uh, much needed, and it's, and it's life changing for people. So putting one of these in makes such a huge difference, particularly in the public buildings, because people will travel. It means, you know, if you're a carer that you, you can leave home and you can travel further because the, these facilities, I think there's about 1,200 across the UK or something now. Mm -hmm. That figure may have changed, but um, yeah, re really, really need, love to see more in the workplace, uh, but not mandatory yet. Yeah. Do you, I don't suppose you know any figures of how many people do actually have, have them? In the work, in a, in a corporate workplace environment, do you have any any knowledge of that? Sorry, to well, be I'll give you don't. a couple of examples because they're, they're clients. BBC have them and are yep. putting them all in, and BT yep. are putting Great. some in. Okay, um, just as a start, but there, there's probably dozens more. Fantastic, thank you. And um, we've got another question: How do you link inclusion in design and build with the focus on green and zero carbon? Many organisations get the latter, but don't seem to place value on the former. Would you like to answer that, Nikki? Simone? 
I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, yeah, no. Don't think I understand the question of what what the, what they mean. Do you? Do you? Um, I was hoping one of one of our experts might. So he's saying, oh, well, how I do you think the exclusion? I can't see the question, but I, I think it might be about the social. You know, there's a social part of sustainability. Yeah. Sustainability so, I'll just, just read the question making. again. So he says, how do you link inclusion in design and build with the focus on green and zero carbon? Kevin, do you want to drop us a note and tell it's, us more It's about difficult because with design and build, sometimes you've got less control over yeah. what the design is doing. I think that might be what the question's implying. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the green agenda also includes inclusion and accessibility, because if it's not inclusive, then it's not really sustainable because people won't want to be there for very long. Yeah. Sorry, that was wasn't, wasn't clear, was... Kevin. If you want to drop us a note and tell us what you what exactly you wanted answered, and we'll, we'll certainly put it to the panel. Sorry, Jim. I was about to say as well, yeah, just um, from yeah, a JLL yeah. Tetris perspective, um, when we do look at our sustainability pillars, um, obviously inclusion um, and social uh, economics are also all included into that. So when we look at a building to design, when we're going to fit out for a client, those aspects are actually already included into that. So I do think as a lot of companies are signing up to carbon neutral, net neutral, and they're looking at different designs, they are pulling on these um, ethoses and pillars at the same time. So I definitely would say um, it is out there and it is being done. I don't think you, you there's, yeah, that's how, that's how I'll leave it. Okay, um, just back to the um, the gender neutral bathrooms again. I knew that this would, would kind of um, create some debate. So Tony asked, um, are you finding employers are suggesting that women who are not cis women should only use gender neutral facilities then? Jean, have you got any experience on this? So. Or, or should 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 no, the I, facilities be should, created? Any, anybody anyway. should use the gender neutral facilities. Yep. It's not a dedicated facility at all. I'm just saying that there should be a mix. But a trans notice, woman. I mean, I've used the term male female, but we would normally just put the symbol on. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. what I think what Tony is getting at is that um, if somebody is a trans woman, they should be able to use the female toilet. I think that's what he's probably There's alluding no to. Reason why they shouldn't. He said yes. My, <laughs> yeah. But my understanding is that sometimes um, a trans person, certainly during transitioning, is more comfortable um, going to a gender neutral space. But it's about choice again, as all yeah. these things are. Fantastic. So it's about creating the facilities and letting people use them how they how they see fit and how they identify and how they use them. And um, Chris has said that their gender neutral facilities have purple doors. <laughs> Sounds very nice. Um, I, yeah. just want, I just want to get on to another couple of points because the time is ticking along. Um, Jean, I know when we spoke, we talked about um, a lot of people returning to the office and there is some COVID guidance, but some of this guidance has been causing some issues specifically around people with, with um, disabilities. We, we chatted a little bit about that. Can you just explain um, what, what's been going on and what the standard is that, that you've been involved with or that, that has been being rolled out? Yes, yeah, so what happened was we were contacted by BSI. They had produced um, what they call is a, is a new model. It's a flex standard which means it's produced really, really quickly to an emergent situation. And they produced one on around COVID very helpfully about managing people returning to work the first time around, not after the second lockdown. And um, there were quite a few comments, I think, of concern from disabled people particularly saying they were disadvantaged generally by the COVID situation. It wasn't covered enough. So myself and Pip Jackson from UCL, so we both sit on the BSI committee, came involved with this flex and standard to make sure things like, you know, um, see-through face masks, um, making sure that if you've got one way system and part it's lifts one way and stairs another, that um, everybody understands that there's some people that have to use the lifts both ways and, and how that works, making sure the PEEPs plans still work if there's no buddies in the office, lots and lots of things in there. So it, um, I've just checked be before this call actually, it's now an ISO standard, it became an ISO standard in January, which is really, really fast. It's mm -hmm. freely available to everyone. And the number is 45005. Um, so we, when we were writing it, we had to be very conscious of international language and protocols to make sure that it, it could quickly roll, roll on to become an ISO, which it has, which is great, led by the UK. And, and, and there were FM players in, that, in the room for that. 
Amazing. Well done, Jean. That sounds fantastic. So anyone who wants to get a copy of that, that's ISO 45005. Yeah. Um, just one more thing that I'd like to touch on before we um, before we finish for today. Um, I know that um, something that you've been quite interested in, Jean, is um, about designing for menopause and something that, that has kind of come up within your within your work. Um, do you want to just tell tell our audience a little bit about that and and you know the, some of the solutions, the potential solutions that you've come up with? Yes, so we've had a, a few clients now ask if we could we could help them. If, you know, was it included? And of course, it's not covered anywhere. There is some HR type management guidance, I think, which probably Simone and Jen would be more familiar with around um, the provision that you make, the management provision. Yep. And in terms of the physical provision, which is more what I was looking at, um, it's a lot of it is around um, coping with um, um, a situation where you sort of steam up and, and feel, you know, temperature control, if you like, but very, very extreme. Um, so we were looking at solutions um, such as identifying cooler spots in the building which quite often can be uh, un, you know stair courts that are used for fire escapes quite often very cool someone can go in there and 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 that menopause situation with the body temperature is also experienced by um younger women who are going through ivf um it's also experienced by some people who are transitioning so it is an issue that needs to be addressed mm -hmm. and even menopause menopausal women alone are a huge part that age band is a huge part of um, most organizations um, and some people end up um, retiring or giving up work or changing jobs early because the situation is so bad but that's a big part of it so we looked at the um, stair calls we also looked at whether if you've got a highly ventilated and cool room such as um, maybe your uh, server room whether you could have another room adjacent to it with, with vents through so it sort of became a, a touchdown hub for everybody that needed to know that that was the area that was really cool. You could just excuse yourself and go in there for five minutes. Yeah. The other thing we looked at was whether fans, they don't have to be electrical, just the movement of air across the face is really helpful, particularly for meeting rooms. So whether they could be incorporated or discreetly provided um, yeah. were the key ones really. And there were other aspects, but those were the main ones. Thank you. That's really helpful. And again, you know, for, for some women, menopause can go on, you know, for five to seven years. That's a big chunk of somebody's work life. Um, so again, you know, creating inclusive spaces where women feel, you know, that for a lot of women, this still isn't spoken about and it's really embarrassing as well, uh, which brings me nicely onto our June um, webinar where we're actually going to be talking about um, women at work and the issues that face women in the workplace. And we have um, an expert in um, menopause coming to talk um, about, um, you know, the issues that, that a lot of women do face and we're also hopefully going to have somebody um, who is going to be talking um, either about the new policies around um, miscarriage leave and that kind of thing and looking at things that are specific for women so that's going to be on the third Gemma you're always good with the dates the third Tuesday of the month so the next one is going to be for anybody that would like to know so I make that 15th. the 15th of June and it, as always it'll be at four o'clock um, so I hope that's really you know helps people think about their space and um, you know their environments in a far more inclusive way thank you so much Simone and, and Jean um, for, for all of your input and Gemma as always thank you for being an amazing co-host um, does thank anyone you. have anything they'd like to finish with before before we sign off No, all good. Thank you so much for being here. And um, the recording will be um, on the Talent FM website um, by Thursday. Um, so you can pass on to anyone that couldn't make it today. Thanks very much. See you all Thank at the next you. one. See Take you later. Bye-bye.